It's a great pleasure to have our speaker here with us today and have a leather lecture. I'm Blaine Brownell, director of the School of Architecture here. And uh, in the room with me, in addition to Miriam Eskandari, our, our lecturer, uh, is Betsy West, uh, uh, faculty coordinator of our uh, lecture series, and Greer Friedrich, executive uh, assistant. And uh, we have uh, Mona Azerbaijani, uh, who's our graduate program director. And Mona has graciously uh, agreed to organize some of our wonderful students to come together in a panel uh, to ask questions and, and be in dialogue with our speaker uh, towards the end of the session. Maryam Eskandari is the founder of Meme Designs, a multidisciplinary studio in the vanguard of creating sacred spaces that address contemporary needs through sustainable materials. Meme Designs focuses on creating architecture that isn't merely beautiful or functional, but that also gives communities an opportunity for inclusive transformation and cultural dialogue. Uh, I argue those are sorely needed today. Miriam's work has been recognized with notable awards, including a two-time recipient for the National Endowment of the Arts, Doris Duke Award in Architecture, Harvard Alumni Association Award in Architecture and Design, and Woman Entrepreneur Award presented at the White House under President Obama. She has taught at Harvard University, Boston Architectural College, and California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. She served as a founding bo board uh, member for Open Architecture Collaborative, Harvard's FDR Foundation, and is on the advisory boards for uh, Clean Aqua in Ghana and the 1947 Partition Archives in India. Uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Miriam Eskandari. Thank you, Blaine, um, and thank you everyone for being here. I know everyone's got studio and other things that are happening around, <laughs> around the nation and on everything, all sorts of things are on our mind. But this afternoon, I just wanted to share with you guys a couple of things. Um, and this, and the, when the primary focus of this lecture is, you know, how do we discuss the practice of architecture um, as an interdisciplinary um, profession? And, and how do we make it impactful um, in, in the uses of, you know, in the realm of like social justice um, and, you know, creating spaces and design. And today's lecture, um, it's gonna, I'm gonna give you guys a brief um, history, an arc, you know, a history lesson that we might not always get in our um, discipline. And, um, and then I'm gonna share with you guys some of our projects that have culminated in the last 10 years, but more so um, I'm also like really excited to share some of the research that we've been doing in our studio that has, you know, that our practice and our uh, buildings have been built on um, this, you know, this, this theory that we have and the research that, um, you know, that's been a decade, a little bit more than a decade old. Um, so with, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started if that's okay. Um, let me make sure. If you guys can see my screen, correct? Okay. Yes. So today I'm going to focus on a couple of topics and how they kind of interlax, um, interact with each other. So obviously right now the hot topic is uh, BIPOC, um, but we've been focusing on the issue of BIPOC, you know, for the, you know, personally myself from the time that I started my architecture career, you know, two decades ago, but more important, like, you know, more focused now is the term BIPOC, so Black Indigenous people of color in, in realms of our urban fabric in American society. The other one is, the other hot topic is right now the HR 109, which is the new Green Deal. And again, this has been something that has been on the forefront of our studio. Um, you know, how, how, you know, what are the basic human rights that we have um, that, you know, in just for our living conditions here in the United States and, and how can we make that more impactful? And when, when we all were going to school, our generation, the word sustainability was constantly thrown around and lead, being LEED certified and et cetera. But more so, there's more to the idea of being sustainable. It's kind of like the underlying foundation. 
And I'm going to hit these three topics. Um, but I'm also going to show them in, you know, a series of our projects. So we've broken them down into the cool house theory effect, a small, medium, large, extra large, right? We got to we got to get in some cool house in there. Um, but how do we bring everything together? So the first area that I'm going to focus on is these two agendas, BIPOC and the small projects. But before we do that, I want to give you guys that history lesson. So here we are, you know, here's a map of the Muslim population all around the world. Um, we can see that it's really diverse. We can see that the gradient that we have here, there is, you know, there is a large Muslim population um, in countries that we would never have expected. Um, and more so what we're going to focus on today is obviously the United States. And we can see right now, it's, it says it's about seven to 15 percent of the American population um, identifies as Muslim, whereas you know in other countries which are darker, it's 90 to 100 percent. So that seven to 15 percent is maybe you know they right now they've said that it's about like eight million Muslims reside in the United States, um, and that also is you know the level of who identifies with it. There's there's a large population of people who um, do identify as being Muslim, but might not necessarily you know express it outwardly or you know be within a certain community based on where they're living. So. And I'm going to take you guys on a timeline of what our, um, you know, the American Muslim uh, history is here in the United States. We're going to actually start off with 1492. Why? Because, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? And, you know, and then, of course, some of our other dates is 1776. This is where the United States got its independence. And I'm going to bring it to our current day right now, November 6, 2020, is what is happening um, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so, again, if anything happens, feel free to open your mic and, you know, tell us any sort of news. Um, so the first thing that happens, the history of American Muslims actually start at, at 1492. And this is where um, the king and queen of Spain, which is uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, basically forced over 300 to 800,000 Muslims who were residing in Spain to convert to Christianity. And at the same time, over 70,000 Jews were forced to convert to Christianity as well. If you didn't convert, you were put on the ship with uh, good old Columbus and you were sent over because you are no longer, you were either you know, issued the death penalty or you are no longer welcome to be in Spain anymore. And so with that, a series of um, you know, Muslims started coming over and majority of them were uh, Senegabanian um, region you know, of Africa. Um, so others were Mauritanians um, and Senegal's. Um, and so we, this is the, our very first movement of the, you know, African slave trade that, you know, started coming over. But from there, we do have some very prominent um, African Americans who, in this one, in this case, it's Mustafa, Mustafa Zamori, who was known as Estav Estavinko. Um, he actually came in through, um, you know, another ship that came down into Florida. And he really made a name for himself. He explored all around, you know, the um, the desert, you know, area, the Southwest and New Mexico. He built a lot of stuff in Florida. And um, so this is why we get a lot of, you know, the um, Moroccan, the Moorish architecture that kind of migrated over from Spain. Um, and so this is this is, you know, one of our very first Muslims in the United States. Then of course, in 1607, Virginia you know, Company founded Jamestown. Just hold that note because there's a reason for it. And then we have in 1630, uh, the Puritans founded Massachusetts Bay Colony. And the reason why these two dates are so important, it's because at this time between 1675 and 1700, we allowed for 6,000 Africans to be um, brought over from, you know, as slaves, and they started working on, you know, on the farms in Virginia and Maryland. And all of these 6,000 Africans were from, again, the Muslim countries of, you know, Africa. And so we made it perfectly okay. And then in 1731, <clears throat> 
France took advantage of the civil war that was taking place in West um, Africa, and they too emulated. So they brought over 6,000 you know, African slaves from Louisiana, to, um, from Mauritania and Senegal as well. And so here we are with a huge influx of now um, you know, African slaves who are now officially African Americans. And this is in 1731 is our first recorded mosque. It was a pre-existing structure for congregational purposes. Um, but then, you know, it was demolished um, as things shifted around. And, you know, in 1776 is finally the United States gets its independence. We would hope that things would change, but not always um, things change. And, you know, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, if we want change, it has to happen in a slow manner. So we're going to move forward from here. So this is one of the very first, um, you know, African-American Muslims, uh, Yarrow Mahmoud, um, who lived in Georgetown. He was a slave. He was from the Bial family. Um, and for this guy was an incredible, like, you know, human being. He, you know, after 44 years, um, you know, he was freed and he became an entrepreneur, a bank investor and a homeowner in Georgetown. And he kind of like set the wave and a precedent for everybody else. Um, and then in 1847, we have our first, um, you know, you know, convert. So it's no longer an African-American Muslim, but it's actually kind of like, you know, the Yankee Muslim. It's the white dude who then converts to being Muslim and changes his name from, you know, Alexander Russell Bell to Muhammad Alexander Russell Bell. And what's really important about him is that he actually becomes an advisor to President Grover and moves to the Philippines and also comes back to the United States and has a huge impact. And one of his, um, you know, impact is takes place in 1892, which is the very famous, the world, you know, uh, exposition, which is the World's Fair in Chicago. And, you know, and we all read about that in our um, survey, uh, architecture survey books, but we don't know the impact that the World's Fair had. And one of the impacts that it had was that in 1892, um, Olmsted and crew decided to create the first quote unquote mosque, which um, as, you know, as a way to say this is little Egypt. Um, and, but what they did was, you know, they, they made it very um, cartoonish. Um, they brought in a lot of images and dialogue, in a sense, um, to say that the people from these countries weren't um, technology, technologically advanced. So this is the time when the railroad was already happening. We were talking about cars. But in Little Cairo, what it was was, you know, this, you know, emulation of, you know, Islamic architecture, which was supposed to be the mosque. And then it was also... Um, camels and cows, um, whereas in all the other areas, it was, you know, the other countries were represented by railroads, cars, cameras. So they were all technologically advanced, while Egypt and the rest of the Muslim country wasn't necessarily technologically advanced. And even further, they brought in um, this lady who we've all, you know, we've seen and it's kind of been in Hollywood. Um, she's known as the Hoochie Coochie. And so this became our first exposure to the Muslim world, right? Belly dancing, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And so between ornate architecture and belly dancing, Hollywood ran with it. And so here we are and now all, you know, Lawrence of Arabia is now, you know, being out there. Um, and so this is our first, you know, exposure to, again, uh, Muslims in the United States or Muslims, you know, in other parts of the world. And at this point, it's where um, a lot of our American Muslims, particularly our African American Muslims, were like, this is, this is not who we are. We know our identity. We know who we are as American Muslims. And we want it, we want it back. Um, 
And so one of the first things that happened in 1914 was that they united under the United Negro Improvement Association. And it was here that they actually created, with the help of the association, African Americans actually created their first mosque. And they didn't allow for others to narrate their story of saying, you know, this is the ornate architecture we're going to have, or this is the kind of, you know, um, Orientalism we're going to take forward. And you know, and then in 1924, um, what happens is Congress passes what they call the National Origins Act and allows for a series of, you know, um, you know, immigrants to come over. And with it, um, at that time, is, you know, the dedication of, you know, there's an influx of, um, you know, immigrants from the Muslim world that come over. And at this time, this is where the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C. gets built, because this is where we want to say we are an inclusive country. Um, you know, we're open to everybody. And this is President Eisenhower, who is at the opening of the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C. And what's interesting about this, although, you know, it is it, to its own merit, a very beautiful building, um, what's, what's very fascinating is that it was it was an emulation. It's almost, um, you know, the ornamentation and all of the building structures were very nostalgic. Um, they were brought in by different countries, so from Egypt, Turkey, and Iran, and um, and it didn't really fit in. It was right at the heart of, you know, in the middle of Washington D.C. It's on Massachusetts Boulevard, where it is predominantly Muslims did not live across the street from the White House. Right, they lived in the suburbs and or you know it's scattered areas. So this wasn't necessarily a mosque that was supposed to be used. It was kind of like a building that was like, you know, we're here, we're gonna show off, this is who we are, this is the kind of money that we're dedicating. And of course, you know, it was a gift um, by the three countries. So the Shah of Iran um, you know, spent a lot of money um, thanking the US. <clears throat> and this was kind of the very first. Um, you know, appreciation for it, as, as well as Turkey and Egypt as well. At, in 1964, there's roughly about 1.1 new Muslims um, that had immigrated to the United States. So we went from, you know, roughly, I would say, you know, 400,000 from, you know, in 1492 to, you know, them all changing, um, you know, some of them becoming Christian, some of them, you know, putting behind their um, heritage to now an influx of about a million or so uh, new Muslims here. And with it comes the oil boom, right? So what's important is that we have to understand in, in the previous is in 1965 is also when we go in and we, um, you know, allow, you know, basically build alliances. So as the United States goes in and builds alliances with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, with it also comes, you know, a certain um, like, you know, transactions. So we open our uh, borders and say, you know, more Muslims are obviously welcome. And with the fact that, you know, Muslim countries will say, okay, you know, here we're allowing for our people to come over, we'd also like to do the same thing. We'd also like to, um, you know, bring and allow for people to come over, but we also like to build mosques as well. So it's here where, you know, we see the trend of, you know, from 1960 to a huge influx of mosques being built all across the United States. And it, it kind of taps out in, you know, the 1980s. And then, if you notice in 1990, this is where the Gulf War happens. Um, so, you know, we in, you know, we have the, you know, Saddam invades Kuwait, we go in. And so this is where it all kind of taps out um, and we no longer technically allow for, um, you know, Muslim countries to come and determine our urban fabric or our spaces, our religious sacred spaces anymore. And obviously, you know, at this time it just kind of drops. And, and you know it's over. It's at this critical moment that it's it's in 1990 where you know American Muslim, the younger generations, now once again demand and say we want our um, you know American identity, our American Muslim identity back. So give it back to us. And they're out there determined to get it back. Um, so one of the oil rich countries uh, that sponsors here is this is a building by Skidmore Owing and Merrill. It was funded by the Emir of Kuwait. 
And this one is Omar ibn Khattab. And um, this is also a mosque that's right in the heart of Los Angeles. It's never used. Um, people don't go to it because not that many people you know, live right in the heart of Los Angeles. Um, they live in the suburbs. And same with Skidno Oing and Merrill, it's on 96th Street, it's on, you know, and majority of the Muslim population either live in Brooklyn, Queens, uh, you know, Jamaica Plains, or they live on the other side, which is New Jersey. So these were again, kind of like, you know, um, we're here, we're dominating this, we're, we're just taking up space. But what's interesting about these buildings is the same language. So we have domes, minarets, domes, minarets. So we've now identified, um, whereas American Muslims previously were saying, you know, or African Americans did never identified um, with this style of language, architectural vocabulary, or any of that sort. Um, you know, they were just using pre-existing buildings to use as congregational prayers and just to have a place for themselves. So here we are once again, and we've determined that domes and minarets are the it thing. And, um, and like, like I mentioned before, and th this is actually you know, a map that we've been documenting. Um, this is all the African-American mosques in the United States as of right now. So you can see that they're spread out. You can also see where you know, Pennsylvania has a majority, Atlanta, I mean, Alabama and Georgia have a lot of mosques. These are obviously because of you know, their ancestry, this, that's their home. A lot of it is also in Virginia, Maryland and you know, the DMV area. And then you can see based on history as, you know, um, you know, we did away with slavery when majority of people started moving to California, they, you know, there's Los Angeles and then there's the Bay Area where a lot of people cultivated. Um, and then, you know, kind of absorb this. And then this is all the mosques in the United States. So there's roughly about, um, you know, 2000 plus mosques in, in the United States. Um, but just to kind of put that in perspective for you guys, um, the city of um, uh, Fort Worth, Dallas, Texas area um, alone has over 2000 churches. So imagine just that city versus, you know, this is a whole, this is our whole country. Um, but it's what's really fascinating is to see if I can um, go back actually, is to see this is, these are the people who identified as themselves as African-American Muslims, and they know of themselves as American Muslims. Whereas this is the influx of a nostalgic um, immigrant mosque um, that have been put around the US. So going back to the development of our vocabulary, domes, minarets, that's, that's the identifying as American Muslim. And of course, Las Vegas ran with it. Um, so we have the Aladdin Casino. Um, this is a picture from, gosh, I think before it was demolished. Um, it, you know, the very first time that I saw this, I was like, oh my God, this is my favorite mosque. Um, it's got all the features, right? So it's got the domes, the minarets, the arches, and Aladdin is thrown on top of it. And um, this is the interior. Oh, this picture is a little off. But this is the interior of the place. It's got, you know, the very Moroccan um, feel. And of course, my other favorite uh, mosque in the world. Um, so, you know, this is, you know, you, you gotta love it. Um, it's got all the features too. So it's got like, you know, the domes, the minarets, it's got everything in there. Um, so, you know, for when I started our research, I actually started challenging the American Muslim community. How do we want to be identified? What is important to us? Um, and so I started asking these questions and <clears throat> of course, at the, you know, when I started doing this kind of research, 9-11 um, took place. And so, you know, kind of everything was a little bit on hold um, because following 9-11, there was a lot of hate speeches that were taking place. And so, and they were also attacking um, the, you know, the, you know, the mosques area as well. And at this point, you know, we would get phone calls um, in our, you know, at the time, you know, I was, I didn't have my studio, but, um, you know, people would call me up and they say, what do we do? And I was like, well, you, you kind of stick out like a sore thumb here. You've got the domes and the minarets and how do you identify yourself? Um, so there was, you know, the events of 9-11 kind of, you know, made the American Muslim community kind of step back and really think, 
about their identity. And it was an existential crisis um, that was taking place here in our country. And then of course, fast forward um, in 2015, um, you know, our president, um, you know, our current president basically says, you know, they want to completely shut down and, and they go into um, one of the things that he narrates is that um, the United States will have absolutely no choice but to close down some mocks where some bad things are happening. And this was an alarm clock, um, you know, it was like a bell that was ringing across the United States, especially amongst the American Muslims. And so there was an internal struggle um, between the immigrants that were coming in, between the African-American Muslims, and between the younger generation of um, Muslims that, you know, that are American and that have been born here, raised here, you know, their third, fourth, you know, generation. Um, and they basically came together and said, you know, we need to reclaim our spaces. And so this leads to our first project. Um, so the very first project is actually that I'm going to show you guys is in regards to the, you know, the events that took place. Um, a university professor called me up and said, you know, I need a place. I want kind of like a Zen den. I need it to be reminded um, of, you know, what my beliefs are. And I don't feel um, safe or comfortable um, going into a mosque. So can you please create a space for me? And um, so we spent some, you know, we spent about two weeks with him. We really got to know him. And it was our very first, um, you know, interior renovation. It's about 3,000 square feet um, of what we call a Zen Den. Um, and we basically, um, you know, really got to learn from him. And one of the things that he really shared with us was a verse from the Quran that says, you know, you know, Allah, which is God, is the light of the heavens and the earth. And he said, I want you to create a space for me that just represents this verse. So, you know, the parable of his light is as if, is as if there was a niche within a lamp. And so we took that idea and we really ran with it. So this was, you know, early sketches is how do you create a very sanctuary space, very intimate sanctuary space for roughly about 20 people, you know, some people that he finds close to him that he felt comfortable with inviting into his home. And, you know, and, you know, to have certain rituals, um, you know, to read poetry, to, you know, practice mysticism, um, and also to make it very um, pluralistic. So he really wanted to have a space that would identify with all the traditional faiths. Um, so one of the things that we did was we created this niche, obviously, literally taking from the line, but we wanted to, you know, create these three doorways, which would represent the Abrahamic faith. So Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And, you know, from there, we started playing around with the geometric shapes and then trying to create this very simple idea of a space. But for us, when we were doing this project, it kind of rang a bell that more and more of the older generation um, is, you know, doesn't necessarily want to be exposed or want to be known um, or wear their identity as a Muslim identity um, all the time. They want to kind of keep it internal, to keep it private, keep it close to their heart. And so then we started doing a series of um, surveys, which now leads to the second project, which again is, you know, for people of color. And um, it's the Children's Museum of Manhattan. And this project, what was really interesting was because of all everything that had happened, the museum called us up and said, you know, we want you guys to take, um, you know, 3,500 square feet of our exhibit space and tell us the whole history of Islam. And I said, oh my goodness, you want me to do, you know, 14,000 years of like history and, you know, in, you know, this amount of square footage, are you like kidding me? Um, but, you know, we took on the challenge and we started exploring the idea of, you know, how do you, you know, who's your audience? So our audience essentially were children from six month old to 12 years old. And this is, and we worked with this team of psychologists and um, teachers to basically understand that it's roughly about the age of 
you know, four to about eight, if you get student, if you get your children at that age and expose them to the right spaces and to the right history, that will change their course. So they will be able to evolve um, and be inclusive um, and be open to new ideas. So we knew that we had a, you know, a challenge at our, um, a challenging task. But what we wanted to do was we didn't want to you know, just say, okay, we're gonna create like a Moroccan room or a Syrian room. We spent some time understanding this map again, which was, you know, here are all the Muslim countries. And these are all the, you know, countries that have Muslims in them and they all need to be represented. So the exhibition ended up being called, um, you know, America to Zanzibar, A through Z. Um, so this is every country. And we basically started, you know, thinking about different ways of, you know, how do we create, you know, and exemplify Chinese Islamic architecture or just Chinese architecture that would be for Muslims or American Muslim architecture or Moroccan architecture or Persian architecture. And so, you know, and then how do we bring it to life? How do we use textile and water and, and the idea of a garden space to really engage the children? How can we also use the other disciplines like um, music, movies, um, sports um, for them to all get involved? And so with the help of National Geographic, the Met, you know, it was like, it was a whole entourage of a team. Um, you know, they helped us put together, you know, some of these ideas, you know, of creating this charbagh, you know, Indian style um, architecture or landscape and garden right in the middle of an exhibition space um, to then give us windows of, you know, where this kind of architecture can open up. Um, with Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road, we actually put, you know, put together a series of musical instruments where now kids can, you know, go in and play and put together, you know, their own musical chords and then take it home with them to say, this is, you know, what we've done. And when we were exploring this idea, and obviously, you know, architecture is something that we don't talk about, um, you know, when we are always invited to give these lectures is the budget, right? So we never really talk about, um, you know, what happens with that money. And we actually, when we were doing this project, <clears throat> um, the money, you know, like every time we had an idea, it would just, you know, kick up the budget and we, and we had to like bring us back down to earth. And at one point I said, actually, we need to now go and get are the money because if this if this project wants to be successful and we and our focus is the next generation to teach them in these spaces we need to be mindful and create that space um so you know the team at the children's museum um you know started to go out there and fundraise and a lot of people were really really open to the idea but some of the you know um uh basically like uh you know, checks that were coming in also kind of had a string attached to it. So it was like, I will write you a check for, you know, a million dollars, but I want you to make sure that in this exhibition, um, we, we want you to, you know, show my great grandfather's mosque and really make it, you know, ginormous. And because I'm giving you this, and it was, it was at that moment where it was like, okay, we can't do this anymore. We need to be very strategic in how we want to teach the next generation. So what we did was we asked them, we said, okay, you know, um, if you want these, you know, these great buildings to be exposed, we are actually gonna create a room rather than building these spaces. We're actually gonna create a room which would be the flying magic carpet room. Um, and this is the only way we could sell it to people, but we obviously did not do that. Um, Cause again, we didn't want to orientalize ourselves in that way. Um, but rather we picked out a hundred mosques and with the help of a series of teams and our technology team and um, our photographers, we ended up you know, creating this 3D uh, world for these kids where on an iPad, they see the map and they can travel to any of the mosques all around the world. And as they move and you see the lights at the bottom and the sensories that take place, this building, these, um, these images move with them. So they can like pretend that they're going from one room to room or they can go from one 
a city to another city and really explore the whole idea of what it's like to be in those spaces. Um, and, you know, until they, you know, they get older and they remember these moments and then they can actually visit those um, spaces themselves. Of course, we got donations as well. Um, you know, certain, you know, elements have to be put in because it's part of the culture. So we embraced some of it, but we actually got some really cute pictures out of it. Um, and we were actually really thrilled to see that, you know, on the cover of New York Times, it actually ended up being a blockbuster, summer blockbuster hit kind of thing. Um, it got a lot of raving reviews. Um, it was, you know, it was one of our shining moments. Um, but I think what, what actually nailed it for us was when we had um, DJ Khaled's kid running around in there. And he, like, he took our project to a whole nother level. And we really appreciated it. Um, his enthusiasm. But more so during the campaign, the last campaign, we also saw presidential hopefuls um, use the space as well um, because they recognized that this is such an important initiative that our studio had taken forth. And so, and, and in educating the next generation of how important architectural spaces are and how all of that, in, you know, seeps into our psyche and our psychology. And so, this became our kind of, you know, our moment where we recognize, okay, we're onto something, all a decade of research, and now starting to, you know, put that into work, we're, we're getting closer into creating something. <clears throat> we thought it was pretty cool. We would get lots of notes like this um, from kids um, that would, you know, that were up in our studio. So from there, we, our next project that I'm going to show you is about, the, it's a medium-sized project, but it's BIPOC and sustainability, but it's the Lighthouse Mosque. So this is a mosque that um, is in Oakland, California. It's, you know, it's a kind of stop and go um, for them. This is actually the Marcus Bookstore. It's a very famous bookstore in Oakland. Um, this is where, um, a lot of the civil rights movement, the activities would take place as Black Panthers would gather here. Um, so there was a lot, there's a, so much history that takes place in this particular building. And the owners have just decided at some point that they could no longer keep up with it. And um, the thing is, is, you know, I took a picture of the murals um, because there was so much you know, love that went into creating these murals, but more so <clears throat> the highway that's there, and this is the location of the building, in Oakland, they were expanding it. And so they wanted to take up that whole strip um, and they wanted to demolish this history. And if you look at a lot of our buildings that have a lot of historical connotation towards them, they're always, you know, there's a great book by my dear friend, uh, Georgia Mask, who's, who just recently was published and it said, what's in the name of a street? So a lot of our, you know, uh, buildings that have that historical connotation are on Martin Luther King build, is Martin Luther King Street. And a lot of them are always right by highway, right? And so as far as air quality, uh, lifestyle, all of that, you know, takes a toll on our health. But more so, it's the chances of these buildings being demolished because we need more spaces for our cars. So, the, uh, you know, a friend called me up and he's a developer and he said, you know what, we're thinking about buying it. And we're actually thinking about not only buying it, but saving it and, um, and then handing it over to one of our dear friends. And, and then they told me, you know, um, it's Imam Zaid Shaker. Um, who is an African-American, very prominent in the African-American community, and has been very active in the Oakland area for Af African-American Muslims. And so we want to get this building. So one of our things was, you know, basically really studying how we can, you know, go up against the city and say, we need to save this building, historically preserve it, um, and then also renovate it in a way that could be, you know, a historical moment that can be opened up for others to come and see, um, you know, a place like this that takes, um, that's part of, a, you know, the narrative of our society. So this is the interior. It's it's actually one of the most beautiful, um, you know, open spaces, um, exposed structure. And we said, okay, you know, the best thing to do is, you know, to not only 
buy this particular building, but to also buy the adjacent lot and really expand it and really try to, if you're, if you're uh, gifting it to the Lighthouse Mosque, is to really try to create a lighthouse um, for them. And so one of our ideas was this, and this was, you know, a taken up to the city. So, you know, creating that beacon of light, that beacon of hope um, for a lot of, you know, family members who, you know, for generations on end had come there, but more so also integrating the idea of landscape architecture, growth of plants, you know, um, you know, reviving that space to create a more healthy community. Um, you know, and, and lastly, of course, to preserve a building, to preserve a history. Um, and of course, keeping, you know, all the interiors the same, uh, trying to keep it as open as possible, allowing for everybody in the community to be welcome to come in and out of that space. So the next project I'm going to show you guys is a large one. Um, from that project, we then you know, another, uh, we got referred to another group of developers and um, so Oakland is, you know, just further up and then you just kind of drive down roughly about 30 miles and it's suburbs of the Bay Area, which is Pleasanton and <clears throat> developer came to us and said, we, um, we want to do the same thing. There's this building, it's called Super Franks, and we actually want to buy it and we also want to donate it because everybody is now, you know, on this thing on this bandwagon of, you know, buying and creating nonprofits and then and donating. And we studied this building extensively. And one of the things that we studied about it was the context. So again, this is another building um, right on another highway. And, um, you know, and then th what's amazing is that, <clears throat> if you guys can see my mouse, um, all around here are, you know, high end luxury homes, which, you know, onto the west side. So the roughly starting price of these homes is 5 million. But then there's all of these factories that are right below the red dot. So these are, you know, it's kind of grimy. Um, there's a water sanitation area. There's a whole, and this, all of this area is, you know, north of the dot is new, new development. So, you know, the, what we call the suburbs, um, they used to be farmland. And so they're now building on them. And all of those homes are to accommodate um, these, you know, factories and, you know, um, you know, the this, this Silicon Valley, essentially. So this is, you know, where, you know, everything kind of gets built. Um, we, we kind of were like, really, you really want to, you know, create another mosque? Like, you know, can we, can we kind of move away from that? Because the, there's a mosque, you know, so Oakland and, you know, the Lighthouse Mosque is roughly about 20, 30 miles away, but there's actually another mosque, like just five miles down the road. And there's another mosque that's like eight miles down the road. So why, why this one, you know? And so he was like, okay, so then what do we do instead? And one of the things that we thought about was taking the space and creating a community center. So very much like a YMCA or a Jewish community center, for again the younger generation, right? Because uncles and aunties are just gonna die, and they're gonna, you know, go off into, you know, into the next world. But what happens for the younger generation? And is the, and can we create a space that would be all inclusive? And that was the most, um, you know, important agenda on our minds. And so one thing that we did was it was again a gut renovation of, you know, a gym slash community center type of thing. But the most important idea of our interior renovation, not only, you know, was it supposed to be, you know, very clean and simple, was to have these images of, you know, American Muslims who are, you know, athletes. And for, for the younger generation to actually see themselves in um, their, you know, their athlete or to see someone like themselves to be able to strive and to become an athlete. So, you know, we created, you know, these kind of spaces, but we know we also put these, you know, certain quotes up just so that they would kind of, you know, you know, gravitate children, you know, the younger youth would be able to gravitate towards them and to really hold on to these words. So this one um, was the very first youth, uh, a girls basketball youth camp that took place. Um, Belle Reyes is right at the center. She's the Indiana number 10, Indiana State 
uh, college uh, point guard, and she ran this camp. And all these girls, all of these girls wanted to become, um, you know, basketball players. And we were just so happy to see that, you know, our little space that veered away from being a mosque, but actually becoming this inclusive, you know, gym or community center had this kind of an effect. This um, is Nurhan, and she is actually a marathon runner. She um, has, you know, ran in, you know, the marathons in Germany, the Boston Marathon. She was on the cover of Runner's Magazine. And this is her. She was so thrilled to see, you know, that we actually, you know, chose her as one of our highlight features. There are other ones too. So there's um, Muhammad Ali, there's Muhammad Ali's uh, daughter, Aisha Ali. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, we, we made sure that we kind of represented like the whole body. Um, so they were, you know, they were so happy that the kids could see, you know, the ideas. And, and, and it wasn't just necessarily for, you know, these American Muslim um, role models, it was to be inclusive and all. It was anybody who was, you know, that we thought would be, you know, someone that we could really celebrate in this space. So, you know, in this one, it's Steph Curry. Um, and we said, you know, we really want to, you know, put him up there. And we got to a point that now Steph Curry actually practices at the gym. So the Golden State Warriors do come and hang out. Um, and it's, you know, and ESPN comes and does their coverage in this particular space. So we, we knew that, you know, this inclusivity is something that's, you know, very important. <clears throat> this is just kind of the exterior. So yeah, whew, you know, we were relieved that it didn't become another mosque, but now, you know, we're starting to create other spaces for, you know, the American Muslim community. But beyond just the American Muslim community, I actually want to share you guys some of our, you know, extra large uh, spaces. And this is, you know, something that we're working on right now in our office. <clears throat> so this is in the heart of Los Angeles. You know, this is LAX that's, you know, to the north. This is the city of El Segundo that's taking place. And this is, you know, we, we got approached to do a green beltway. Um, and what was really important was, again, that idea. So that, you know, the whole point of sustainability HR 109 is to, you know, to really give in the whole, you know, incorporate climate change into our design. And also to basically give people their human rights, fresh, you know, you know clean air, clean water, you know, urban space. Those are our basic human rights that we have to, you know, give our citizens. And what we realized was that a lot of these homes were right up against um, LA, uh, LAX. And the pollution level and the noise level is just like, it's out there. And the city had kind of abandoned that series of apartments, this kind of like low income um, housing that's there. And they were building all of these parks all around um, the city itself. And so, you know, we got approached again. Um, this was actually a competition and we, you know, we went in, we did the whole, you know, RFQ, RFP and, and you know, initially it was just, you know, uh, how can you just improve the space? And we saw it as, you know, a place that, you know, we would create a green belt essentially. So we would create this like lush, you know, uh, space, like a park that would, you know, basically consume all of the pollution from the airport and the noise and would actually give a healthy, you know, environment for everyone, all the low income um, apartments and housings that basically run along that strip. When we were studying it, we realized that, you know, the blue butterfly is an endangered species that's there. And, um, and so we really latched on to that idea. Um, so this is kind of, this was our winning proposal. You know, when you land into LAX, this is the kind of the green beltway that you see. They appreciated and love this idea so much that now we're working towards creating it not only as the green beltway, um, but it's also going to be representing the 2028 um, Olympics that's gonna be taking place in LA. So this is, you know, the very first open um, you know, when you land into LA, this is the very first thing that you see, you know, this is supposed to represent all of Los Angeles now. 
And the whole idea was to create this like, you know, a spectacle of, you know, lighting and to emulate both the runway that would be there um, that, you know, that goes from the east of Los Angeles, the whole idea to take this blue butterfly effect all the way out into the ocean and then to create this like green infrastructure that kind of runs along the whole parameter. And you know, creating these like, you know, spaces, these open spaces that would allow for nature to grow, to nature to be revived. And, you know, putting in the certain plants that are essential for, you know, clean air um, that are native to Southern California, and that would allow for a more lush, active environment. Um, we, you know, we've been successful so far in pushing this, that since El Segundo is technically a city called the second, it's the second refinery for Chevron. So the Chevron's refinery, the first one is up in Northern California. There's a Chevron refinery that's also down here. So you can kind of imagine where everybody is kind of placed, right? So they're right up against an airport and then the refinery. So they're in dire need of these kind of green spaces. But um, so yeah, so now Chevron's jumped on board and they want to want to be, maybe it's their you, but they want to be a part of this whole um, idea. Um, and lastly, I'm just going to show you guys another project. So it's very similar to our the previous project, another series of you know low income development housing that's taking place. But how do you again incorporate you know these open spaces for everybody so to give them their basic human rights? Right now with COVID hitting, we've all recognized how important it is to have park access, to be with nature, to actually learn from nature, um, to revive these kind of spaces. And, you know, so in hopes that, and this is one of the trails that are, that's happening in, you know, the San Jose area, but to use the idea of technology, just like the way we did in the Children's Museum, um, you know, and to create those, um, you know, you know, flying carpet, you know, to be able to visit all those mosques, but to also use that technology here, where the sensory sound of plants growing or insects, you know, moving would then be able to, you know, uh, create a musical tone or musical effect for children to be able to come and engage, to be able to come and touch the plants and to see the plants and see the butterflies. So the flora and fauna takes in another realm of life for them to be able to come and for children to be able to come and to be exposed to the whole idea. Um, and also, more importantly, is to take in all the historical context. So, you know, you know, using solar panels and solar technology, the lighting of, you know, the towers would emulate the history of the area from, you know, um, the indigenous people that used to live on the property to, you know, the missionaries to also um, the, you know, Spanish uh, ranchers and to our current, you know, uh, demographics that today, which is, you know, the Silicon Valley that exists. And that's pretty much the end of my talk. If I hope we're doing well on time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miriam. You've given us a lot to think about. And I know uh, the students have questions for you. So Mona, if you I'll take it away. Thank you so much, Mariam, for taking us through the journey and also showing us your projects. Uh, I would like to hand it over to the students to ask you questions. Uh, Noor, please go ahead, introduce yourself and uh, take. Hi, uh, I'm Noor Audala. I'm a third year student. Uh, my question is, first of all, thank you so much for this insightful presentation. It's been like, I'm a Muslim, but I learned a lot of stuff already. My question is, what are the principles of Islamic architecture that can be translated and applied to Western architecture or modern architecture? That's a really good question. So there is no handbook of Islamic architecture. Um, and, you know, and this has constantly been a discussion that's been happening amongst a lot of historians and um, people who do history theory and criticism. And so every time I actually use the term, you know, Islamic architecture, I always kind of just put it in little quotes because I don't think that there is such a thing as Islamic architecture. There's regional architecture, there's vernacular architecture. Kenneth Frampton talks about vernacular architecture. And essentially, I think the idea of, of um, you know, the Muslim world 
and or American Muslims should really be, you know, when they're going to create these communities or mosques or anything, you know, of a space, you know, in an urban um, fabric, should be focused primarily on vernacular architecture. You know, if if we're talking about certain principles, the principles should be how do you create a building that gives back to the earth, you know, um, that is standing on its own, um, that actually helps um, the earth itself. So all of our sustainable features, is it, does it allow for, um, can the rooftop be completely solar to generate the electricity that we need? Um, can the exterior be urban farms um, so that it grows food as, you know, and to be able to give the community in need, uh, you know, as a, you know, soup kitchen, um, you know, and also the same idea of like, you know, where we have food pantries, um, you know, you know, if we're talking about recycled water, gray water system, you know, that's, that's the whole purpose, essentially. The root, the history of, you know, Islamic architecture is so vast, because, you know, when we look at it, it, a lot of the language um, came from Byzantine architecture. So the domes are actually from Byzantine um, ideas, um, you know, and it's supposed to represent this arch, which was supposed to be, you know, heaven. The idea of a minaret um, that we have actually came from Zoroastrian architecture. So, you know, they, you know, it's, it would be a place, it was a temple that Zoroastrians would go and light it up on fire. And, you know, it was the Noor, right? So it was the light. Um, so all of those things have, you know, come together and created, you know, what would be now today Islamic architecture. But, you know, how do you, how do you define those terms when you're, let's say, from, you know, Egypt or Senegal or, you know, Iran or India or even China? And all of us living here in the U.S., you know, we identify, you know, in certain realms with each other. So I remember, you know, early on, you know, in my career in like 2001, 2002, you know, we were doing a project up in Seattle and, you know, someone in the community would say, nope, I have to have, you know, this feature of, because this is, I'm, it, we have to have it because this is guaranteed paradise. And it, this is a feature of Islamic architecture from Lebanon. And someone else was like, no, you know, that's actually not heaven. That represents hell. And then, then they would just, you know, argue about it. And it was just like, someone bring me a manual of, you know, <laughs> where do, what are the principles? Um, so yeah, so I think going back to creating buildings and spaces that give back to earth um, are the basic principles. Hi, Miriam. Thanks so much again for uh, for sharing with us today. My name is Joseph. I'm a first year MARC. Um, my question for you is, um, and I, I guess we kind of saw this in what you were showing with the athletes and and, and um, being in California, celebrities kind of coming through. Um, do you believe in a social in the social impact of architecture on its environment? And um, if so, how do you achieve it in the design process? And how do you measure that? Yeah, that's such a really good question. Joseph. I do believe in it. Um, I believe that, like I mentioned, so, you know, um, in the 80s, when there was an oil boom, um, you know, we actually did a lot of harm um, in creating these spaces. So we, we just kind of went crazy in building new styles of architecture and also abandoning um, certain buildings. And, and you see that in, you know, in um, developments of downtown versus suburbs, you know, et cetera. So I do believe that through architecture, through, uh, you know, each firm or each studio, you know, has their own set of principles. For, for us, you know, there's, there's, you know, participatory design, there's, you know, equality and equity. And, and of course, given like, you know, right now we're focusing, you know, on issues of how do you um, narrate the historical and cultural importance of, you know, the community that you're designing for. So whether, you know, we also have like another client, which is of the Chumash uh, communities here in Los Angeles. And, you know, we've had to learn a lot about the indigenous Chumash community and all of their hurdles that, you know, they've had to gone, you know, to go through in order to, for us to actually build the right 
building structure for them. So I think, um, you know, the historical and cultural aspect is also important, but more so right now, you know, how do you, you know, how do you and who do you team up with to create a space or an architectural, um, you know, element that actually, you know, gives back to some of the principles that are right now in the HR 109, which is, you know, access to clean water, clean air, creating jobs, um, you know, how do you how do you incorporate those architectural programming and architectural design to have all of those realms? And I think you know hopefully we've started um, the whole idea of sustainability and lead was you know a starting point. But I'm seeing and I'm really happy to see that we've moved beyond that and we're digging much deeper in that um, in those um, aspects. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mariam, a lot for your presentation. My name is Nagar, and my question to you is that uh, your firm seems to range in different scales, uh, in scale more than the average design firms. And uh, the question is that what made you to not just limit yourself and your firm to just the buildings, but also include, the, as we see in the presentation, a large scale, extra large, and also the small ones, the small like product design that that was obvious on on this uh, on the website of your fame. So, what are some of the benefits and let's say on the other hand, hardships of this kind of approach to the design and the projects? Yeah, that's actually a really good question, Nagar. We do do a lot. Um, our our projects vary in scale, um, as you mentioned. When a project comes in to our office, we kind of you know before we say yes or no, we kind of step back to see how can we make it impactful? Um, and, and that's how we basically choose our projects. I'll be very blunt and honest. There have been times with no project, it's been dry, you know, um, because no project that was that we could actually, you know, speak from the heart and that would mean so much to us would come in through the door. Um, but the good thing also is through these projects, you actually do cultivate a team too. And so you bring in other people that you know are experts that can do a great job. And so then you, you tend to team up together and you go after, you know, whether it's designing, you know, uh, a flag for LACMA or, you know, designing, you know, a bigger, um, you know, urban space. And, you know that you have a good team behind you because you have that synergy and you all come from the same ethics and principles. And so you, you, you have that. And I think that's what makes, you know, great projects um, very, you know, you know, you can celebrate those moments and you can actually see them, um, you know, when, you know, and, and I'll, and I'll tell you guys something about myself. Um, I don't go to my buildings. I have never gone to an opening of as my space or my building. Um, and I usually just let, you know, when I do let go, I'll probably go two, three years later and I go as someone who just sits in the space and I observe to make sure that I did design a correct space and we learn from it, you know? And, and I think that's, you know, those lessons from the previous designs or the previous projects, you carry forward with you um, to make your next project better and your next project better. Hi, uh, thanks so much for sharing with us. Uh, my name is Jake, I'm a first year master's student. Um, and my question is kind of similar to Nagar's, but in addition to the large uh, range and scale of projects, I noticed that a lot of the projects range very greatly in location. Um, so like you talked about today, a lot of different cities across America, um, but also projects in other countries. Um, and so I was wondering if there's any specific challenges that come along with that, um, whether that be related to like cultural expectations um, or just different laws and requirements that different states and countries have. Yeah, um, as long as they have good food, Jake, we're there, we're down. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, one of the beautiful things about our practice is learning different cultures and learning different history. Um, so, and I think this is where one of our, um, 
you know, principles come in. So that, that idea of participatory design. So we spent a great deal amount of time reading on history, reading different books, um, because, and then we also go on the ground and we spend a lot of time with, you know, the client and with the community members um, to make sure that we understand. And sometimes, you know, usually at the beginning, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, right now, given with like COVID, it's really hard for everybody to travel, but, you know, um, but some of our other previous, you know, our projects that we've started previously, it, you know, it's actually given us a lot of opportunity to learn more about the history and the culture and sharing that with the client because the client might be like, no, I don't think, you know, when we were growing up, it wasn't this way, but it was like, but when you were growing up, that doesn't necessarily mean it was right. And here we are to correct the wrong, you know, to, and to make it right. Um, and so we see that, you know, right now with, let's say, you know, the American Muslim community, you know, by no longer allowing for, you know, foreign money to come in and to build mosques, but rather them taking ownership. And it took us like, you know, a, a long time to get to that point and to, you know, really be knowledgeable on the history and the culture and the communities and being you know on the ground and really talking to people and then being able to put ourselves out there and and talk to people and give presentations um it was scary it still is scary um you know you know because you really do like you know you become vulnerable and you expose yourself right but then at the same time, like in our studio, we, you know, you kind of get to a point where you kind of know yourself, you know, you know what culture, what kind of culture is important to you, you know what history is important to you, you know, like for us, like, you know, inclusivity and pluralism, all those things are so important to us. Um, and so, you know, you just, you just put those, you know, pieces into place and you, you know, you put it out there and you, and you see what happens. Uh, hi, Mariam. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, hi. Mohamed, uh, first year of MR uh, program. And my question uh, from you is that um, what special qualities uh, would be the essence of designing a mask, mask especially uh, when it comes to define uh, an identity? Uh, I mean, something uh, more. Um, beyond uh, a formal symbol such as dome or minaret? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think, you know, the best person who we've spent some time studying would be Hassan Fatih. Um, he, you know, created this beautiful rammed earth mosque in um, New Mexico. And, and it goes back to, you know, Noor's question that I said was, you know, one of the most beautiful um, aspects of a mosque is it for it to be vernacular and and how do you create a space a building that you know gives back to the earth so for example what we create let's say in New Mexico we don't necessarily can emulate that and put it in Alaska you know it would it wouldn't work or what we create you know in um California, you know, in Los Angeles right now, we wouldn't be able to create or emulate that in the heart of Manhattan. Um, it just, it doesn't work. So that vernacular aspect um, and also, you know, creating a space that gives back to our environment, I think should be the priority of, you know, when we do come to create these um, religious spaces. Now there is, you know, there are some elements of, you know, where, you know, the idea of uh, religious principles come in. So how you practice comes into architecture. And those are always, you know, up for debate. Um, and it just depends on the community that you're designing for. So for example, like the Lighthouse Mosque, um, you know, the community didn't have any gender issues. They didn't have, you know, segregation. They didn't have, they were very inclusive. So, you know, it was nice to just have this very open, you know, you know, big space. Um, and, you know, like another one of our projects, you know, in Boston is they do have segregation, you know, issues. 
the, how the mosque itself has been built, but what they asked us was to create a cafe and more of a very dynamic, you know, community space for not only just, you know, the Muslim community, but everybody, because there's a high school across the street, there's also a community college across the street, for it to kind of be like, you know, a hub gathering space. And, you know, the, some of the questions that we had to ask them was, it's, you know, in, in that particular realm is, what are your, um, your, you know, religious principles? Because if, you know, if you have, you know, like, you know, gender segregation or, you know, certain other elements, it's kind of hard to design. Um, so we need to first resolve that. Everybody has to come, you know, come together on that. And then it's, it becomes easier to design for a more inclusive space. So I think that, again, um, what Joseph asked was, you know, how do, or um, I think it was, um, let me see, I'm sorry, uh, it was Jake. Um, what he asked is the history and the culture and also being able to back up your ideas through, you know, the research that you've done makes it a more successful space. And each space should be different. Each space should be different and capture um, the community and the city and the urban context that it's located. Hey, thank you, Mariam. We have one question from the students. If you don't mind, I'll just read on that. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent do you think that uh, should mosques in America retain or reject uh, Orientalist uh, ideas in their design? And in your opinion, should these new a design typologist be, uh, be formed or should and also recognizable to non-Muslims? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So one of the principles that we have every, you know, in our studio is every design move that we make should have two reasons for it. So if the purpose of a dome um, is to, you know, if it's going to be a green roof, if it's going to collect water, if it's going to, you know, have, you know, some other environmental feature or some other purpose to it, by all means, go for it. You know, let's have the dome. Um, if the minaret is to, you know, I don't think nowadays people go up at the top of the minaret and shout out, it's time for a prayer, it's time for prayer anymore. Um, you know, it's mostly, um, you know, our cell phones might go off or, um, the person in the, you know, in the space might crank up the boys speaker, you know, and so people come in. So, you know, it's not like, you know, every, every time I'm in Cambridge, I always, you know, chuckle a little bit because the church across our, you know, apartment, and it tells me it's one o'clock, it tells me it's two o'clock by the ringing, you know, yeah, okay, it, it that still has a cultural and historical connotation to it. Um, but I do tell you that a couple of times when the bell went off at like four o'clock in the morning, I had to call up the city in Cambridge and be like, this is against city ordinances, <laughs> please fix that. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, but back to some of the, you know, architectural vocabulary, as long as it has a purpose, um, by all means, I think everybody should do it. But if we're talking about a Disney-esque type of identity, I think that we're setting up our communities up for failure. Um, you know, we don't, we don't need to, you know, plaster anything on the facade when it has no purpose, right? Um, what did Alvaro Alto say? Ornament is crime. You know, let's, let's take that, you know, all the way through and really think about the purpose, you know, of our design spaces and our, you know, using natural materials and using space, you know, material or um, architectural um, elements that actually give back again to our environment. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. We really enjoyed having you and uh, hearing from you and seeing your projects. Uh, I think we are about time to go back to the studio and I um, appreciate you join us today and like a virtual clap for the audience. <laughs> well, thank you guys for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. And I look forward to hearing from some of you. Yeah, Miriam, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanna say this is, this is such an important conversation to have right now and, and not one that we really ever have, or at least not that often. Uh, 
And I just, I wanted to uh, share my appreciation, not only for uh, the knowledge that you shared with us and also the work that you do, but also uh, what, what I perceive as a kind of uh, quiet fearlessness and perseverance uh, in, in your work. I mean, there's, as you know, well, I think we all know well, there's so much fear uh, and discrimination and so much ignorance in the world right now. And it's just exacerbated, right? Uh, in recent, with recent events uh, that I think, you know, uh, the way that you just kind of uh, continue to, to do the great work that you do in spite of uh, current events is really inspiring. And I hope that, uh, you know, our community will take that we take that away as inspiration for ourselves too. Well, thank, so you. thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, uh, thank you, Mona, so much for uh, organizing uh, this panel and, and thanks to all the students for contributing. It was Everyone good to see you guys. <laughs> take yeah, care. Have,